Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 12. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's covered here in Matthew chapter 12, so um, I'm going to get through this as, as quickly as possible, but it's going to be very exciting, you see, because Jesus touches on the Sabbath, the teachings about the Sabbath. Did he break the Sabbath or did he not break the Sabbath? We're going to be talking about that. Also, some more healing, some more miracles that he did, some more wonderful works that he did uh, that really amazed everybody. He talks about Beelzebul as well, Baal Zebul, uh, the fruit, good fruit and bad fruit. He uh, would talk about the evil spirit, and we're going to wrap it up by talking about what Jesus defines as his family. So let's get right into this. This is Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the grain fields. His disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Now, uh, this in context, so you understand what heads of grain they're talking about here. Now, it wouldn't be heads of wheat. They're not going to be like just picking, picking, you know, wheat like that, just raw wheat and just shove it in their mouth and just start grinding the wheat. You know, you don't eat wheat like that. No, they're talking about corn here. Um, so this is Jesus and his disciples went through the cornfields on the Sabbath and they were hungry. Okay. But the Pharisees, when they saw it, said to him, Behold, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, you need to understand this. Now, the Pharisees are, there's a lot of people today that are like Pharisees. I know many of you would probably chuckle just for to hear me say that because everybody's got their idea of what a Pharisee is, right? Here you will see that Pharisees, they were they pushed things to the extreme they put burdens on people that were that they don't even want to carry they they couldn't carry um so pharisees they they took the commands of god they took the guidelines of of god that god made and they narrowed them down they narrowed they made it even more, like god said okay here's the narrow path well, the Pharisees made it so narrow, it's like you're, you're walking the line your whole life. Okay, so you need to understand that the, what the Pharisees said here was not really God's will or God's law for that matter. Because you see, they mixed God's law and man's law, okay? Man's interpretation of the law and God's law. And you know, many, many Christians do that today. Christians do that today, not maybe so much in the in the uh, in, in the sense of God's law, but they go to church or they watch TV with a with a preacher on it, or they listen to radio, or they listen to a video on the internet or whatever, and they automatically merge the the things of men with the th things of God, and that's one of the greatest problems today is that people listen to a you know, high fluking preacher. Uh, pastor, bishop, priest, pope, whatever, and they 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 automatically or even sometimes subconsciously equate what they say, their doctrine, and maybe even their practice with the doctrine and the practices of the Lord. Okay, I remember one time being in a uh, in a meeting where I said, "What do you think of when I say Jesus?" And everybody said, "Church," and so. Uh, like this was in a, in a meeting where not everybody that I was talking to were churchgoers, okay? But still, uh, generally speaking, uh, when people think about Jesus, uh, generally speaking in the world, I mean, uh, they think about church. They think about Jesus Christ, they think about God, they think about church. And really, uh, church is really doing a very, very bad job these days, generally speaking. Sure, there might be the odd one. or the odd, you know, God has his people that are that are really in the right place with him. However, organized religion and this whole thing that that's going on today and you know mostly in the, especially in the developed world uh, in regards to church is really doing God a disservice, really really not doing justice at all to the name of the Lord. So this is what the Pharisees did. They took from their rabbis, they took from their their leaders and they went by what the rabbis said 
as opposed to what God's law actually says. They go, they, they, you know, some people out of pride and arrogance, some people want, I mean, some people, they, they somehow want to feel good about themselves. So they, they want to lord it over people. So they want to load people with extra rules, extra, extra laws. Okay. Like, Oh yeah, like it makes them feel good to actually to to assert some kind of authority over people, albeit a false authority. So that's what happens. You see, man in his sinful nature, he tends to when it comes to religious things, he tends to err along the side of, you know, God said, uh, you know, you have to go twenty miles, so to speak. Well. I say we'll go 50 miles and we'll make it a rule that we go 50 miles. You know what I mean? When God only wants you to go 20 miles. And so people listen to this, these preachers uh, that are just basically going on false humility. I mean, it's just arrogant, really just arrogant. It just makes them feel better to say, yeah, I'm going to put more of a law. I'm going to put more of a restriction on you guys. You know, just kind of, it just feeds their pride, which is, you know, is unfortunate. Um, but anyway, so this is what the Pharisees did. Did They took the law of God and they, they just, they took it and they took it to the extreme. Not only did they take it to the extreme, but they added to it. Okay. But Jesus said to them, haven't you read what David did when he was hungry? Key point here. Hungry. Okay. Let me just stop here for a second. Jesus never said, okay, put it this way. The Torah, God's law, never said, you must obey the Sabbath even if it causes you great pain. If Even if you're half starved, you cannot eat. That's not what the Torah said. Okay. That's not what the Torah said. The Torah is God's blessing to man, not God's burden to man. Read Psalm 119. Read Psalm 119. You'll see how the Torah, God's law and commandments, are a blessing to humanity. Not a burden, a blessing. The law of liberty, as James refers it, uh, refers to it as a law, a law of la- a liberty, excuse me. That whole concept of the law of liberty comes from Psalm 119. The longest chapter in the Bible. The chapter with every verse talking about the Torah in some aspect. His commandments, his law, his ordinances, his statutes, his word, his judgments. You know, on and on and on it goes. It's over and over and over again. Um, Yeah, very interesting. So Jesus replies to the, to the Pharisees that took the law and added to it, made it, making it more restrictive than it really was initially supposed to be. Haven't you read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? You see, Jesus knew that he was the substance and David was the shadow. He knew that he was the real, true David. And yes, there was a real David that lived before him. Yes, you know, King David. And so he knew that King David, in all of his exploits, in all of his life, was just a reflection of him, for the most part, okay? For the most part. Haven't you read what David did, how he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered into God's house and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat. It was against Torah for him to eat that. Neither neither for those who were with him. So it's two, two different breakages, if you can, if I can use that word, of the Torah. One, that David broke it. And two, the people that were with him broke it. 
It was only for the priests to eat, it says here. This is Samuel 21, 3 and 6. Okay, 3 to 6. So let's go over there and read this. I'm just going to quickly jog over here to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. And I mean, Jesus rebuked them saying, have you not read? Well, let, let's read, okay? Let's, let's really get into this. Verse 3. Now, therefore, what, what is under your hand? Please give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or whatever is available. Okay, now, just, this is what David said. This is in context. This is what David said to Ahimelech. Now, therefore, what is in your hand? Please give me five loaves of bread in in my hand, or whatever is available. The priest answered David and said, I have no common bread. In other words, no bread for you, that's lawfully for you, but there is only holy bread. Only the bread that only the priests, according to the Torah, are supposed to eat. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said, Truly, women have been kept from us as usual these three days. When I came out, the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was, uh, though it was only a common journey. How much more then today shall their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him, the priest gave him the holy bread. For there was no bread there, but the showbread that was taken from before Yahuwah to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Okay, so Jesus refers to that, referred to that, 1 Samuel chapter Chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 3. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 3. Interesting how many times Yeshua always refers back to the scriptures, Samuel, uh, Psalms, uh, Isaiah, Malachi, on on and on and on it goes, right? Verse 5, Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Or have you not read in the law? Have you not read in the Torah? That on the Sabbath day, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? But I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. So Jesus was saying, listen, the priest profaned the Sabbath for the temple's sake. For the temple. You are looking at one greater than the temple. Verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not not sacrifice. Hosea, Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. You wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, Yeshua made it very clear here that the Torah is about a ble- it's it's a blessing for from God to men. It's God's grace to men, God's love to human beings. The Torah. Okay. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It says in Hosea chapter six, verse six. Now. Way back when, when I was first really starting to meditate upon these things, I was trying to think, what is the difference between the so-called Old Testament and the so-called New Testament? And I thought, well, you know, in the Old Testament, they did sacrifices, and that's how you please God. That's how you got, you know, your sins forgiven. You know, the sacrifice, it was, it was a, a sacrificial lamb, made atonement for your sin and so forth, the sin offerings and this kind of thing. That's what pleased God. But in the New Testament, it's Jesus. That's not true. That's not true. How many times in the Old Testament do we have God saying, I don't want sacrifice. What I want is for you to repent. You know, obedience is better than sacrifice, he said. Here, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. 
Psalm 51, David said, if it were sacrifice, if it were animals that you wanted, I would bring him, but you don't want that. You want a broken and a contrite heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Oh God, you will not despise. So, you need to understand that Yeshua, Jesus is, is, is coming on a totally different level than the Pharisees. The Pharisees were more like, well, you know, let's just go by the letter of the law. Where Jesus, Yeshua was like, no, we got to go on a higher level than that. Or another way of looking at it, we're going to go on a deeper level than that. We're going to go to the spirit of the law. Why? What was the reason behind the the commandment of the Sabbath. What is God's heart here for, for men and women? You know, a lot of people don't like God's commandments, especially when it comes to sexual purity, about what we're supposed to eat, about how we're supposed to live. But God only made these commandments because, number one, he knows you can obey them if you really want to. He provided a way. And number two, he knows that it's, the best for you. It's the best. God wants the best for you. If you're foolish, you, you'll ignore it. You'll say, well, Jesus, we don't have to do that anymore. I'll just believe in Jesus. What do you mean you will just believe in Jesus? Jesus is all about this. He's all about Je Genesis to Malachi and then some. So, Jesus condemned the Pharisees here for not knowing the heart of God. Not knowing that God, there's, there, there are greater commandments and there are lesser commandments. Some people believe, well, if you break one commandment, you're, you're breaking them all. Well, I know they, they quote James from that in James chapter 2. James is just talking in a very general sense, okay? Whether you're a lawbreaker or not a lawbreaker, Okay. He's, I know Chris, so many Christians, so many pastors, so many church leaders completely, totally misinterpret this and misunderstand James completely. <laughs> Absolutely misunderstand it. Because James was just talking on a very general sense. Are you a lawbreaker or are you not a lawbreaker? If you broke one, you're a lawbreaker. It's just like, it just makes you, puts you in the same category as if you broke, you know, another, you know, or two or three or five or six or 10 or a hundred commandments. However, that's not to negate the fact, that's not to override the fact that there are greater commandments and there are lesser commandments. How do we know this? Well, I mean, Jesus himself said, there's the greatest commandment. He said, those who teach people to break one of the least of these commandments, okay? So there's there are lesser commandments. There are greater commandments. There are commandments that are more important to, to, uh, to obey. There are commandments that are less important to obey. Another reason why we know this is because you read in the Torah the different levels of punishment. Some commandments, if you break them, the punishment is very little, if any, punishment. Okay? While others... We got maybe fines. We've got maybe beat. Uh, some people just get, <laughs> I mean, all kinds of different punishments, including at the top would be the punishment of death. Capital punishment. Yes, that's in the Torah. That's in God's law. Okay, that's God made that up, by the way. And he said, I am the Lord, I change not, by the way. Okay, so anyway, um, There are lesser commandments because there are lesser punishments. There are greater commandments because there are greater puni punishments. So, Jesus here was condemning the Pharisees for, for making one of the lesser commandments a greater commandment and, and, and completely ignoring the greater commandment. God didn't want anybody to go hungry on the Sabbath just because it's a Sabbath and they can't lift their their you know, their hand to their mouth or they can't, you know, you know, open a can of beans or whatever. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Uh, no, uh, if you're hungry, you eat. 
unless of course it's a special day you know that uh, that we're fasting you know obviously but he said, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, verse 9, he departed from there and went into their synagogue. Again, Jesus going to the synagogue. He didn't go to church. He could have. He could have said, okay, Peter, James, John, Thaddeus, hey, all of you guys. Hey, you, you're my 12, man. You're, 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 you are my disciples. Let's build a church. I mean, literally. Let, let's uh, get out the bricks, get out the mortar, put up a, you know, a steeple, and we're going to have church. We're, forget going to the synagogue. We're not doing that no more. Uh, we're, we, we have our own thing going on, a new thing going on here. We are going to church. And one of you is going to be a pastor. No. It's not his will. That's not what he said. He, he, he always went to synagogue. Always. The disciples, after Jesus died, rose again in the book of Acts, went to synagogue. They preached in synagogue. I know some of you are thinking, well, church means people. Yes, it does mean people. So the church went to synagogue. Ecclesia, the church, meaning the called out ones. By the way, if you are in the church, if you are really part of a church, the church, then you better live called out from the world called out from the set you better not be listening to secular music secular tv secular radio going into secular this that or anything else because you are supposed to be set apart holy unto god called out the called out ones translates into the greek ecclesia which translates into the english church the word church by definition, means holy people not part of the world system. Not thinking like everybody else thinks. Not living like everybody else lives. Living holy, set apart. So Jesus could have said, oh, I'm going to build a church. Let's go build a church. Now, I know that he said that to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Speaking of, you know, building it, building it, building it up in a, in a, in a, in a way that he's not talking about buildings, of course, um, not buildings, literally physical, you know, houses, buildings. Uh, but uh, he's talking about just exhorting, encouraging, like it says in the scriptures, that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So he's going to build up his church upon this rock. I will build my church. Does that mean the church did not exist before that, before Jesus was born? Absolutely not. It says in Acts chapter 7, the ecclesia, the church, existed with Moses. And that's another whole story. Putting a lot of bugs in your ear, right? you're going to, you got a lot to think about. But hey, we're supposed to be thinking about the scriptures all the time. So yes, he went into their synagogue. He, he could have had, I mean, he had all the chance right there to say, hey, let's go, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to start a new religion and we're going to have church instead of synagogue. Uh, 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 uh. That's not what he did. Verse 10, and behold, there was a man with a withered hand. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they may, might accuse him? See, they're looking for a way to accuse Yeshua, they're looking for a way to accuse Jesus. They're just trying to find something wrong with him because they hate him. Why do they hate him so much? Because he preached against sin. Well, he's a friend of sinners. Uh, uh, excuse me? He called them sons of Satan. He called them whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside. You like to make yourself look so pretty, but inside you're dirty, filthy, rotten, stinking. Rotten flesh. Very putrid people. I mean, he called them all kinds of things. Brood of vipers, snakes you are, devils. Why? I mean, of course, these people would be not very happy with Jesus. No, no, Jesus wasn't this lovey-dovey hippie guy that went around hip hugging everybody and kissing them and saying, God bless you all. I love you all. He didn't say that. Verse 11, he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? If this one falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, won't 
he grab it out and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. Now, if you look, now I'm a, forget about the New Testament right now, just for a few seconds. If you look into Jewish law, I'm talking about non-Messianic Jewish law. They will tell you, go ask a Jewish rabbi, is it good, is it lawful to do good to somebody on the Sabbath? It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Come on. I mean, that, even, the, even the Jews would tell you that for the most part. I, 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 don't, I don't know of anybody that wouldn't. Okay? Perhaps there is. There might be somebody out there that would say it's not lawful. But yeah, even in Jewish circles, without the New Testament, without Yeshua in the picture at all, would tell you it's lawful to do good. If you see an old lady fall down on the go while she's crossing the road, yeah, you get out of your car and you help her. That's lawful for a Jew to do that on the Sabbath. Yes, it is. So they knew it was lawful. Jesus knew that they knew it was lawful, but he said, therefore, it is. He confirms with them, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. Then he told the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was restored whole, just like the other. It was healed. Miraculous a miracle happened here. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how they might destroy him. See, they couldn't really argue against him because Jesus knew that they knew that even their law allowed people to do good on the Sabbath. But they just hated him. They just hated him. Verse 15, Jesus, perceiving that, withdrew from there. So he knew that they were out to get him. So he said, okay, guys, let's get out of here. Great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Again, healing them all. These people were people who were very humble, very much dedicated to God, very much not offended by Jesus' harsh rebukes and teachings against sin. They were ripe, okay? That's who the all was. And what he, and Jesus didn't, didn't go knock and go, he didn't go door to door just knocking on any Joe Blow that didn't want to, you know, repent. No. He healed all the ones who actually really had interest in following him and repenting of their sins. Verse 16, and commanded them that they should not make him known. Again, how many times do we read this over and over and over and over again? Not like the TV preachers, at least most of the TV preachers. They want to be known for God's mighty work in my ministry. Jesus over and over and over again said, shh, don't tell anybody. Shh, 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 shh. There was a mighty miracle happen here. I'm not looking for attention. Preacher, if, you, if you're a true preacher of God, this is your example. Follow it. Verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the through Isaiah, Yeshiahu, the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit on him. He will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not strive nor shout. Neither will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He won't break a bruised reed and won't quench he won't quench as smoking flax until he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will hope. If you actually go over to Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 4, you will see something similar to that. Okay? Yeshayahu uh, chapter 42, verses 1 to 4 says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my servant in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout, nor raise his voice, nor cause it to be heard in the street. He won't break a bruised reed, and he won't quench a dimly burning wick. Uh, he will faithfully bring justice. He will not fail nor be discouraged until he has set justice in the earth, and the islands wait for his Torah. That is Jesus' mission. We're supposed to be waiting for, for the Torah 
to be given to us through Jesus. Just like, keyword here, like, L-I-K-E. It came through Moses. You see, Moses said the prophet, a prophet's coming, speaking of Jesus, and he will be, you know, you should listen to him, and he will be like me, like me, like Moses. A lot of people think Moses and Jesus are opposites. <laughs> no, they're not. Some people say, well, you know, uh, John said that, you know, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus, as if the law and grace are, 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 are opposed to one another. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If the law is opposed to grace and grace is opposed to the law and you use that verse to, to prove it, then you must say that the law is opposed to truth and truth is opposed to the law, that God lied. No. The law, the Torah is the truth and the Torah is grace, is God's grace to you. He loved you so much he told you, he gave you instructions how to live life, how to be blessed. We'll go back to Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Then one possessed by a demon, blind and mute, was brought to him and he healed him. So that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Now, I just want to say here too, you notice that the, the people who had, had these, what would you call it? Um, challenges, sicknesses, diseases, uh, infirmities, handicaps, whatever you want to call it, they were like that because of a sp because of spiritual reasons, not so much to like it is today. Today, a lot of people is for other reasons why they're sick. You know, it could be because of their diet. Back in that, back then, it wasn't because of their diet. They ate kosher. They ate kosher. They ate according to God's law. And again, God's law is healthy. God commanded us to eat the clean, but not to eat the unclean because he knows that's healthy. He created the body. That's the manual, the user manual. The user's manual for the human body. Leviticus chapter 11, the dietary laws of God. This is what's good for the body. This is what's not good for the body. This is what's good for your soul. This is what's not good for your soul. So the people that were, that were in need of miracles back in those days, for the most part, they had it was a spiritual problem, not so much a physical problem, root not so much a spiritual a physical cause excuse me it was not so much a physical material cause i.e diet or whatever smoking or whatever but it was more like a, a a spiritual thing because these people they ate clean they ate good verse 23 all the multitudes were amazed and said can this be the son of david you need to understand, son of David, Ben David, is another expression of the Messiah. Okay? There was three great expressions, even to this day, in Judaism, that was that 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 clearly refers to the Messiah. One is Ben Adam, the son of man, the son of the you know the son of Adam, the seed of Ab Adam. Why? Because that was the promise to Adam that he will produce. It was his. It will be his seed that will be the Messiah. Another one is Ben David, which is the son of David, because it was prophesied to David that his son, his seed, will be the is the Messiah, his seed. The Messiah is found in David's seed. So can this be the son of David? Can this be the Messiah? That's what they were asking. Another expression, I said there's three. Son of man, son of David. And another one you don't see too much in uh, the so-called so New Testament. But as soon as I say it, I know some of you will probably smile because... It's so obvious. But even today, the Jewish people, they say the, the Messiah, one of the titles of the Messiah is son of Joseph, son of Yosef. Okay. Verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this man does not cast out demons except by Baal Zebul, the prince of the demons. 
These people really hated Jesus. Again, why did they hate Jesus? Because he went around hugging everybody and kissing them and telling them how much he loved them and, and, and just washed all their feet and giving them all glasses of water all the time? No. They hated him because he kept on, he rebuked them so harshly, condemned them to hell. Condemned them for, the, for being sinners. Hypocrites. He hated them. They hated him, I mean. Verse 25. But uh, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house that's divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I by Baal Zebul, Baal, Baal is Lord. We hear that name in the, uh, in the, Old Testament many times, Baal, Baal, Baal Zebul means Lord of the Flies. If I, by Baal or Baal Zebul, cast out demons, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then, the, then God's kingdom has come upon you. God's kingdom has come upon you, not the kingdom of the devil or Satan. Or how can one enter into the house of a strong man and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man? Then he, he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who doesn't gather with me scatters. Remember that next time you see a street preacher. Remember that next time you, you see someone that, that's preaching some truth of God that you say, well, I, 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 the message is okay, but I don't like the method. Whoever does not gather with me, Jesus, scat, uh, says Jesus, scatters. Whoever is not with me is against me. Be careful who you speak against. Verse 31 Therefore, I tell you, these are Jesus' words, the words in red. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will, will not be forgiven men. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, neither in this age nor in that which is to come. Now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot to say about this because there's a lot of watering down about this teaching in, in the church today. A lot of watering down. Some of the pastors say, well, if you, if you, if you receive Jesus, if you, if, you're, if you still come to church, you must still have the Holy Spirit. And if you still have the Holy Spirit, it means you never blaspheme the Holy Spirit. <sighs> or they say, well, if, if, you're, if you're still, if, if you're... Uh, if you're worried about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that means that you didn't because the Holy Spirit is, is kind of convicting you or the Holy Spirit's with you, um, you know, kind of, kind of making you worried about it so that you don't. That's not what Jesus said. He didn't say that you will, that if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will be completely numb to it. I mean, numb to... He didn't say you, you, you'll just completely walk out of the fellowship. He didn't say that. He just warned them. He said, listen, you, if you speak against the work of God and you say it's the work of Satan, you're in trouble, big trouble. You, not, you will not be forgiven. By the way, not being forgiven means not making it to paradise. You understand that, right? God doesn't allow anybody into his perfect holy heaven that is still stained with sin that has not been forgiven. It would be hell to be in heaven with unforgiven sin before God, because if it's unforgiven, you are in line for the wrath of God. It just, it just, it doesn't make sense. No. If you have unforgiven sin in your life, Kingdom of heaven is not your place. Paradise is not your place. No matter how much you might think it is. 
Most people who are in hell thought they were going to heaven, by the way. Check it out. Check out testimonies of people who have passed away and have come back to relay a lot of horror. Verse 33, either make the tree good and its, and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. You offspring of vipers. <laughs> Again. Oh, yeah. Jesus doesn't, you know, he doesn't hold back anything here. Loving, loving Jesus wouldn't offend. Don't call people the family of devil. When people come into the church, pastor, don't point to the people and say, you're, you're, you're from Satan. You're, 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 you're a son of Satan. You're from the family of the devil. If you do that, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be loving them. We got to love them into the kingdom. Where'd you get that from? Where'd you get that from? False, ear tickling, feel good preachers. That's who. Not Jesus. Jesus said, you offspring of vipers. This is supposed to be your, your example. In fact, this is your perfect example. You offspring of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? In other words, you people... No wonder you're saying all these evil things because you're evil. Not only are you evil, but you are the offspring of snakes and serpents. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is overflowing in your heart, that is what your mouth will speak. And vice versa, whatever your mouth speaks is what is overflowing in your heart. Verse 35, the good man out of his Good treasure, uh, the TR adds of the heart, the TR being the Textus Receptus, which is the manuscript version of the King James. The good man out of, the, out of his good treasure brings out good things, and the evil man out of his evil treasure brings out evil things. I tell you that, that every idle word that men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Yo, yo, can you say that with me? <laughs> Do you know, I've read that they say that within like an hour, they have done a study before. There's been studies before to see how many words do people say in an hour? Just in average, not, not just, you know, in your talkative times, but just average. And it's like, I forget exactly how much it is, how much, uh, how, how many words, but it's like tens of thousands every hour. Wow. Every idle word, every idle word that is spoken, well, you have to give an account of it in the day of judgment. Ay, ay, ay. Sweet Jesus. Um, verse 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. So they're, they're getting, they're kind of getting into it a little bit. Hey, teacher. Hey, rabbi. As you know, when they said teacher, it actually is what they actually said was rabbi. And some translations have that in their translation. Uh, rabbi, rabbi, we want to see it. We want to see a sign from you. Hey, hey, hi, hi, hi. We're like little children here. We're playing around and show us a sign. Do something awesome. So Jesus being so kind and so, and so nice, he, he, he does a sign, does a little sign for them. He entertains them. Oh, okay, I'll do a sign. Wrong. He answered, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man... Here we see that again. Son of man will be three, uh, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. 
and behold, someone greater than Jonah is here. Oh, I, I, may I say this? We, this generation will condemn, will be condemned even more so because we have an abundance of scriptures, which even back in Yeshua's day, we, they didn't have. We have all of the books of the New Testament, which they didn't have. They didn't even have that in the book of Acts. We have, we have even more. So our responsibility is even greater, which means if we don't straighten up and repent, I mean, really, really, really repent. I'm not talking about just being sorry. I'm talking about getting out of the dirt. If we don't repent, we are in big, big, big trouble. You better fear God, buddy. You better fear God. Verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation. The queen of the south, I believe referring to uh, the queen of Ethiopia, which would have been, uh, his, historical documents tell us, and his, uh, Ethiopian history would tell us, even what her name was, and that is Queen Mekeda. Mekeda is her name. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. She traveled a long ways just to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, someone greater than Solomon is here. In other words, she went through a lot. She went through a lot just to hear a few words. And Jesus said to these people, he said, someone greater than Solomon is here. And again, I add, we will be judged even harsher because we've got way more than just the few words from Solomon that she heard. Verse 43 when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he passes through waterless places, dry places, seeking rest and doesn't find it. If you don't have rest, my friend, you have something in common with unclean spirits, devils. Verse 44, then he says, this is the, the unclean spirit that is, will say, I will, turn, I will return into my house from, uh, from which I came out. And when he comes back, if he finds it empty and swept and put in order, in other words, welcome back in, then he goes and takes with himself seven other spirits more evil than he is, and they enter in and dwell there. Now, you, you need to understand this. When Jesus says seven, he doesn't mean literally seven. The word seven means basically a, per, it's a perfect number. It mean uh, seven can mean can mean um, a million, <laughs> for that matter. It just means when when that evil spirit goes uh, goes and gets seven more that's more uh, that's more wicked, more evil than he is. It just means that he gets a lot, a lot. He just comes. He just comes with a whole whack of them. Okay. Um, so he goes and takes with him. This is verse forty-five. Seven other spirits more evil than he is, and they enter in and dwell there. The last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Even so will it be with the, uh, also to this evil generation. And when the evil generation gets rid of the evil, it purges the evil out, and then welcomes it back again, it is way worse in the end than it was in the beginning. Verse 46. When he was yet speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother, interesting, Miriam, Miriam herself, Mary, the mother, as they call her, the mother of God herself comes. And his brothers stood outside. Now, just for some of you to, for your information, uh, the word brothers here in the uh, in the original manuscripts, can also mean siblings. Okay, 
uh, could also include sisters, siblings, and such, okay? So his mother and his brothers stood outside, seeking to speak to him. So one man said to him, uh, uh, look, look, Lord, behold, look, look, uh, your mother and your brothers are outside. They want to speak to you. Nice, nice Jesus, you know, being the nice boy that he is, the nice brother and the nice son that he is, and, and the gracious man that he is. You know, he says, oh, bring them in. I'm mean, Give them the best seat here. I, I, wanna, I want them to be here right with me. No. Read verse 48. But he answered and spoke to them, Who is my mother? <laughs> what? That's how you answer? Your mother is outside wanting to speak to you. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples. And he said, Behold, look, my mother and my brothers. Wow. Isn't that awesome? He adopted his disciples which included the 12 and could have been too also a lot of the other females like the Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, Miriam that would be, not Mary. Miriam would be the real name, uh, would be along with them because they were also considered to be part of his disciples, although not part of the actual 12, um, but a little bit more of the outside fringe of his disciples. Uh, but yeah, they, can you imagine? That's awesome. He, can, you, can you imagine how blessed you would be to be the brother of Jesus or the mother of Jesus? Hi, yeah, yeah. How blessed would that be? How blessed would you be? Jesus continues the words in red. For whoever does, does. Can you say does, D O? E S does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He is my brother and sister and mother. Okay? Awesome, 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 awesome. So you have to do the will of God. You have to actually obey the will of God. And you are, will be considered to be just as blessed as his mother, as his brothers, as his Sisters, siblings. Wow, what an awesome word. What an awesome word to end off on. That was Matthew chapter 12. The next session, we're going to be doing Matthew chapter 13. So hang in there and uh, check, check for Matthew chapter 13. It is going to be awesome. As you go, think about what we were talking about. May the Lord enlighten, your, enlighten the eyes of your understanding to really, really show you great and mighty things. Thanks for watching.